Hello and good morning everyone and welcome to our Inside APSAD webinar for this morning. Uh, we have an interstate presented today which is a great pleasure for us. Uh, but before we go on I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of which we're gathered today and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Extend that to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the room or on webinar land out there wherever you are across this country. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, today we have Dr Michael Doyle from Sydney, from Sydney University. Uh, he's a research fellow there at the Centre of Research Excellence in Indigenous Health and Alcohol. And he's here to talk to us about alcohol and other drug treatment within a prison setting for Aboriginal men. Uh, please welcome Dr. Michael Doyle. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for that introduction. I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners, the land upon which we meet today, and uh, say hello to any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people that may be joining us here in the audience or, or out there in webinar land as well. Uh, I'm a researcher, as, as uh, uh, Jeff said, at Sydney University. And so today I'm talking a bit about my PhD. Uh, there'll be uh, four lots of data, if you like, from this. And that'll be the, firstly, we'll have an overlook at uh, drug and alcohol use issues within the population, Aboriginal imprisonment as well. Uh, and then uh, look at the both the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal uh, participants and then a specific look at what the Aboriginal guys said in it during my PhD uh, research. So, uh, as is the case with uh, qualitative work, uh, we do introduce ourselves uh, so you understand the paradigm from which we're sort of analysing the data. Uh, I was an Aboriginal health worker originally, uh, did my training up at the Kimberley Aboriginal Medical Services Council, worked in community control for about 10 years before moving into the university sector, working at National Drug Research Institute in Perth, Kirby Institute at UNSW and now at Sydney Uni. I have a graduate diploma in Indigenous Health Promotion from Sydney Uni, a Master of Public Health from the University of Western Australia, my PhD was from UNSW. So the photos there are sort of a collage of a bit of my story. The photo in the middle is my grandfather and his contemporaries. My grandparents were born uh, before uh, white people arrived in the Kimberley and uh, so I'm the second generation of my family to have not sort of been born in the bush if you like. Uh, so I acknowledge that different Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people have different experiences of colonisation and how that's impacted us uh, personally and our communities as well. I visit my community quite regularly, but I live now in Sydney, which I sort of think of as home. I've been there about 10 years. Uh, I won't go through all of those, all of the photos there, but I will mention my mum's sister. My mother passed away. This is a photo down on the bottom right hand corner. Uh, and as is the way for Aboriginal people, uh, my mum's younger sister took that role as, as a sort of uh, the mother in our family. And that was my graduation day and uh, mum, Benny, sort of got the plaque and held it up and pretty much ran around like it was a, um, I don't know, it was like a grand final win or something. So it was, um, it was, the, it was fantastic having her there for that. Um, so I'll go on to... Um, a bit more about the research. So why do we do this work? Um, alcohol and other drug uh, research in prison populations. Well, about 75% of the men entering prison uh, report risky alcohol and or other drug use. And uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are imprisoned at much higher rates than non-Aboriginal people. Uh, and we'll be talking about that shortly. But most families are affected in one way or another and I haven't really met a single Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander family that doesn't know somebody who is in prison or has personal experience thereof. This is a priority for the community and it's such a priority that it was put into the Uluru Statement that we are not innately a criminal people. Uh, and from this work we hope that more effective treatment could lead to improved health and perhaps, hopefully, a reduced likelihood of return to prison. So this is the uh, national imprisonment rate. So um, you see there's a, well you can only really see three lines on there. 
So the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, the dark line at the top is the national imprisonment rate, then below that is Queensland, and then down below is you have both the uh, Queensland non-Indigenous and the main non-Indigenous, and those two lines are pretty much identical. Probably doesn't help because I should have used a slightly different colour for both of those, uh, but they're pretty much identical. So you have two stories, or three <coughs> stories, that the Queensland imprisonment rate is actually lower than the national and has remained there, but has continued to trek upwards along that 10 year period or 11 year period. Uh, but the non-Indigenous imprisonment has remained about the same over, this, over that period of time. So while we have this ever increasing imprisonment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we don't have the same trend for non-Aboriginal people. There has been a slight increase, I should say, but nothing like you can see there in that slide. Um, so this is the imprisonment rate for men. Now my work focuses on men, and that's really for cultural reasons, uh, particularly as a qualitative interviewer, researcher. Don't go in and interview Aboriginal women about their drug and alcohol use. Uh, so this is a crude rate. So um, you can see there Western Australia, leading the pack uh, with an imprisonment rate of over 7,000 per 100,000 population. There are really huge issues here that do require urgent national attention. Queensland's doing a lot better, could be doing even better, but isn't as bad as the other states. And you see Northern Territory is the second highest. There is a perception they have the highest imprisonment rate. They have the highest proportion of the prison population is Aboriginal, but that's a function of the proportion of Aboriginal to non-Aboriginal population in that jurisdiction. Uh, so the Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test, as it's used by uh, the World Health Organisation. Uh, so this data is from the uh, Justice Health and Forensic Mental Health Network 2015 Patient Survey. And so a score of uh, 20 plus indicates possible alcohol dependency. And so you can see there for the Aboriginal men uh, that there is a sort of a large proportion of that group within that uh, sort of high 20 plus range. Uh, Anybody who gets a score of over eight, I should say, there is indication for which there should be some follow-up and a possible alcohol-type intervention. For women, uh, that proportion is even larger within that 20-plus uh, range. But just sort of repeating again that, that the whole group within that uh, perhaps need follow-up with alcohol-related issues. There's, there isn't a significant issue within the non-Aboriginal population, as you can see there. So comparing Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal within this group is perhaps not the best thing to do, because everybody in prison could do with a bit of help around their drugs and alcohol use issues. Uh, so this is uh, daily uh, drug use in the 12 months before prison. I should specify the last slide uh, was alcohol use before prison as well, so this is definitely before prison. Uh, of the people who answered that they did use illicit drugs, uh, this is a breakdown of the most commonly used substances, and people had multiple answers, so you could see 60 plus percent plus 40 is over 100 percent, but poly drug use is quite common within this population. So cannabis, uh, over 60 percent, and that's pretty much universal what we see in the general health data as well, so Aboriginal people, there is a high proportion that do use cannabis. Uh, methamphetamine, which is uh, colloquially known as ice, uh, and then you have the other amphetamines and then heroin use as well. So probably don't have too much time today to go through each and every one of those, uh, but this is uh, a good indication of, of sort of pattern of uh, drug use before prison. Now this is quite interesting, this only represents about 20% for the non, for the Aboriginal guys and about 25% or a quarter for the non-Aboriginal people in this survey. But of the, of the people who said that they committed the offence in order to support a drug or to, to buy alcohol or drugs, almost all of the non-Aboriginal people did so to support drugs exclusively and that was something like 95%. There's a, a different effect within the Aboriginal community. So you've got about half said drugs, but the Aboriginal guys, and, and this is women as well, uh, said alcohol and drugs and alcohol. So it's a different pattern of offending to support that habit. I didn't say that quite right, but I think you all know <laughs> what I meant from that. Uh, so I'm making a few broad um, uh, general statements here. 
So just a bit of an overview. So prison-based treatment will generally detox often uh, happens before entering prison while people are on remand or in place holding or court holding cells is when the actual detox from a lot of substances occurs. Uh, the theoretical framework uh, is for most programs, not all, but most, uh, generally originates from the United States uh, and which is the, has the biggest prison population and that sort of thing, so generally. Uh, and treatment programs has evolved, have evolved as new drugs have emerged. So if you go back to the 40s and 50s, it was pretty much alcohol and then things have changed and there are more sort of drugs, more programs with different drugs that are emerging. In terms of types of treatment, you have the psychoeducational, which is sort of your health promotion type approach. Cognitive behavioural, which isn't necessarily a specific treatment. Within cognitive behavioural treatment, there are different types of cognitive behavioural treatment, but generally it's a... Um, a reasoned type, a therapeutic interactive uh, model where you go through reason out why it used and those sorts of things. Uh, therapeutic community, um, once again not necessarily a specific treatment type itself so they can use uh, psychoeducational and cognitive behavioural treatment as well uh, but they also have the sort of living in a community type setting and then you have your 12 step programs which is Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous as well as one to one counselling and people can uh, do a whole combination of these treatments. Now I did a systematic review which got published earlier this year which evaluated, um, this was in the Australian New Zealand Journal of Public Health, uh, evaluated these treatment programs. Uh, this was the sort of bane of my existence, <laughs> what felt like an attorney. Uh, so it started, I uh, did a scan of the literature internationally and ended up with, I don't know, about 3,000, 4,000 odd, I can't quite remember exactly. Um, at the beginning and then through a process of elimination, there you go, there's 13,000 uh, originally that we started with, a uh, process of elimination, um, got rid of all the others and ended up with 25 at the end. There was a lot of research that measured how bad the situation was, but not that much that, re that looked at treatment programs and how effective those programs were. So those 25 papers, about 15 of them are from the United States, two from Canada, two from Taiwan. Uh, we had one from Australia, uh, which is quite an old paper, and then you've got a couple of other countries. Uh, we measured uh, the methodological strength of these, and uh, 12 were moderate or sort of strong, and the others were sort of a weaker sort of methodological um, basis. So four of the papers measured AOD use post-release and, and we found three of those uh, reported a reduction and all three had post-prison care. Uh, only one of those conducted an intention to treat analysis which is, which is really important in this population. So a lot of uh, uh, academic papers will report outcomes based upon the um, treatment group which is all the people who have successfully completed the treatment program and compared that to a control group but actually exclude all of the people that have dropped out in treatment and as everybody who works in this space knows there are a lot of people who drop out of uh, drug and alcohol treatment as the program's going on. Those people don't just disappear so they should be accounted for in, in research as well. <laughs> Uh, similar findings ultimately to the uh, previous reviews and that was, uh, although I'll say that neither of those or three reviews there uh, assess the methodological quality of the papers uh, and what we found was community based with, um, therapeutic community sorry with post prison care was the most effective though overall treatment, you know, overall evidence is limited. So. We're just going to move on to the uh, qualitative data, which is where I did the primary data collection out at uh, this place, which is uh, John Maroney Prison, which is a large, there's a large prison complex out near Windsor, well, in Windsor, out the back of Sydney. Um, and there's actually three prisons uh, out there, and one of them is the women's prison. You've got the medium max and then the low security men's. I uh, just acknowledge my PhD supervisors, uh, you'll see their names on the bottom there. Um, so 
I interviewed 17 non-Aboriginal non and uh, 14 Aboriginal guys and nobody identified as a Torres Strait Islander, so I do just say Aboriginal within this data set. Uh, voluntary participants at a six month treatment program, so they're about to start this uh, intensive drug and alcohol program, but this was done before they actually started, that. so this was about uh, treatment they'd undertaken before then and did a thematic analysis of those interviews. I did the unthinkable and quantitative quanti quanti quantified qualitative data, uh, which I thought it was a bit easier to, to use this um, format to, to give you a general feel of, of the uh, backgrounds of the guys. So most of them are from Sydney. Regional cities in New South Wales are um, uh, Newcastle and Wollongong, and then you've got some from regional towns. The guy from interstate, he's actually from Tweed Heads, Gold Coast, down that area. So, um, and you see the bulk of the popular bulk of the age is 26 and older, and that's the year they left school. So that doesn't necessarily mean that's the year they uh, they'd completed. But that was a question when I interviewed them. Uh, one of the guys, that's the asterisk there, um, he did not go to school at all. And um, most of them had been in for more, uh, only three were in for their first term. So this is the whole 31 guys I'm talking about right now, and I'll be talking about the Aboriginal guys shortly. So the first use was before the offence, and normally alcohol and then cannabis shortly after. And you've got Owen there, who's, uh, these are all pseudonyms, and Owen says uh, marijuana, it would have been pot, yeah, cannabis. I'd say 14, yeah, 14, yeah. And then I ask him about alcohol, and he goes, oh, F. Let's say 11 or 12, yeah, younger. Uh, but I wasn't drinking all the time, you know. And that was pretty common for, for a lot of these guys. Not all of them. Some of them started younger and had a different pattern. But this was a, a good idea of generally what uh, the bulk of them had experienced. In terms of reason for use, uh, it's pretty general. Uh, so Kurt's just talking about peer pressure there. Uh, and he's remembering back and his mates basically said you want to try this and um, yeah I won't read all of the statements verbatim um, but you get the idea from what Kurt's saying. In terms of uh, supply of alcohol that was often by family members and illicit drugs was more by friends or sort of opportunistic. Um, Lee, uh, he was talking about drinking after a football game, I think was the first time he'd been playing rugby or something, or league, um, and so he just said it was fun bro, it was fun, uh, all the adults done that, and yeah bro, all the adults drank. Uh, Lee was Maori background I think, and he, he along with the Koori fellas, tended to call me bro during the interview. Um, and. So it was just kind of the normal thing, and he got in, had a drink with the with the uh, older men in his family. So John, um, this is a good example of once out of school. Um, he didn't get along with the teachers, so he left school. But that's when uh, he started uh, using cannabis and alcohol a lot more. He did it a bit before school, but not that much. But once out, it just increased sort of exponentially. Uh, so in terms of their heroin and amphetamine use, um, began late teens or early 20s. So um, John, again, this is the same guy from the one before, and he'd been so drinking and that, and um, I'll just pick up from the middle there. He'd go, we'd go travelling from Bondi to Coogee and Maruba. We just used to drink a lot, and then I started smoking pot around 16, and then, yeah, I didn't touch heroin or anything until I was 20. I came to jail. He didn't actually start heroin use. He didn't use for the first time in jail, uh, but he went to jail shortly afterwards. But there were cases where people said that they had used for the first time once they'd gotten into jail. And Dave there's talking about um, his ice use and that he went from uh, marijuana uh, drinking using those together, heroin, and then he stopped uh, drinking marijuana, he was only on the heroin, and then when he started ICE, he just focused on that. And so later, as their drug use progressed, um, they tended to be quite exclusive in the drug that they would use and put all their resources into that, so they'd just buy the one drug whenever they could, although they would use what was available as well. 
Um, so this has been described elsewhere. It's a cycle of offending and people sort of do the events to get the drugs and they have unpleasant feelings and symptoms and then the cycle starts again. But um, when we look at uh, some of the reasons for offending, Jay there wasn't actually on drugs at the time and he was very specific about that. He was coming down from drugs, he'd used drugs a day or two days before uh, and he'd sort of been trying to catch a train and this young fella, I'll start reading there, this young fella staring at me and I was pissed off to the max, you know, so I cracked him. So, yeah, no, drugs were, weren't actually involved with me crime, but I don't know, maybe if I wasn't on drugs. And that was pretty much all of the guys had that sentiment that even if they weren't using drugs at the time, if they weren't, if they'd never started taking drugs at all, they might not have ended up in that situation in the first place to have done that kind of a crime. And you got Ben with his social, uh, this is an example of sort of social networks where Ben would say, he, he said he'd use cannabis every day, but he wouldn't, it wasn't drug related. Uh, and I'm not gonna read all of that, uh, but basically this guy had been threatening him and, him and his partner and he decided he needed to take action to, to get that guy to back off from them. But he's, he went on to say that if he wasn't involved in any of the drugs at all or that whole world, he just wouldn't, that situation probably would never have happened. So in terms of to support, uh, support drug use, you've got Kurt, and this is sort of, I guess, the more stereotypical that we would hear through uh, sources. Uh, Kurt basically stole to support um, his drug use when he was really hanging out to go do things he wouldn't normally do. Um, uh, to support that. And this was for the guys in Sydney. Only the Sydney fellas um, talked about having to commit offences to support the cost of living. Now, I don't know what that's like here in Brisbane or other parts of Queensland, but Jim was talking, he's on the housing list, it's like three, sorry, it's about $600 a week for a one bedroom unit in Redfern. Uh, and uh, so it, there is a real issue around that sort of cost of living pressure in that city. So talking about the sort of treatment uh, now, so uh, one of the guys had uh, never been to AOD treatment before, so you could sort of wonder how you end up in a uh, possibly the most tertiary of tertiary treatments in a prison-based six-month drug and alcohol treatment program if you've never done anything before then, but that's um, that was his situation. Four of the guys, uh, they were all pressured by family members to do something before they got involved in the criminal justice system. And all of the others, their first time they ever attended any kind of treatment was when they were arrested or the court <coughs> ordered them to do something or they were in juvenile detention or something. And this is an example of Adam and he's talking about going to drug court and he went to that for a little while and then he got kicked off and then ended up in prison. Uh, so if you think of this collectively for the criminal justice system, it's the biggest drug and alcohol treatment service in the country. Uh, and most of the people going in, it is the first point of treatment that they actually get. So some of the, this is a, a, some of the guys had done community-based treatment, and this is in between sentences, so this isn't just exclusively before they um, were um, involved in, in the criminal justice system. So this is just talking about when they go to those community type programs. They talked about some positive experiences and they needed, if they felt comfortable, if they weren't judged, and if they could trust the program facilitators and the peers in the group if they were doing a group sort of a program. Uh, and this was a sort of treatment they're more likely to return to. So you've got Dave, and Dave I think is talking about smart recovery. Uh, and he uh, says he could go there and talk about anything. I wasn't judged, you know, like if you had a tear come to your eye, you weren't laughed at or anything, and it was that sort of feeling like he wasn't judged. And Chris uh, was talking there about, he went to, I think it was Narcotics Anonymous, and so he says you identify as the same thing, like resemblance. Uh, what he's been through, I've been through the same, same thing, in other words, yeah. And so he felt comfortable about being in that kind of peer environment with other people who had had that same sort of experience. In terms of prison-based programs, um, the 
program for program facilitators, uh, empathy was the most important quality. And that came through with all of the guys, Aboriginal, non Aboriginal, they all sort of said having good empathy um, was the most important thing. Gender balance was preferred. They didn't like, because uh, programs that tend to be uh, facilitated by two people when you do a group treatment program, they wanted at least one of them to be a woman because if it was two men, it tended to get out of control. So the, uh, having women kept the boys on, on track. Uh, so gender balance was preferred. Some lived experience. Uh, so if somebody is, uh, and has no lived experience, sometimes they have a very limited credibility in the prison, so they don't know what, where somebody's coming from and they just get dismissed. Um, I'll t come back to that in a, in a little while. Uh, and confidentiality, which comes through as a feature. So real or perceived breaches of confidentiality are quite damaging because it's a closed community and gossip's a premium. And being older, and I know as an Aboriginal man, we are an ageist. Uh, society and I think generally we are ageist and you don't take drug and alcohol treatment advice from somebody who's 21 if you're 45 sort of thing so age um, can be a real advantage within this setting so the program content had to be relevant so uh, so, so some of the guys identified as mainly being drinkers and they didn't like sitting through the IDU stuff and they'd lose interest uh, if they had to sit through that type of thing. And it had to be practical and useful. And you've got Ed there, he's one of the Koori fellows, uh, and he's talking about um, getting on drugs and working out um, if you had a pouch, you had to pay somebody back a pouch and you wanted to use, and, and working all those things out and what you could do with the money instead. Um, I'm thinking pouches, uh, um, cannabis, um, but being really practical and, ha and having thinking through those things was an important thing with program, con uh, program content. Uh, having a supportive group is critical and trust can be a problem. You've got Jake here and, uh, and he says, so, you know, there's a lot of boredom, frustration and sometimes you get people that like to tell tales and talk behind other people's backs other people's back or talk about someone else in order to make themselves feel better for whatever reason. But the only thing that you you do become a bit wary of, I suppose, is how much you talk about and what you say when you're in the group because because we're living with other inmates, you know. My philosophy is you can't really afford to trust anyone in here. And so it's really, really, uh, if you have people in a, a treatment group that aren't talking much and people don't trust them, the entire group can be sort of closed down from that. So being really aware of, of, of how sort of involved people are within, within the treatment is a good thing. Uh, so there's a lot of other data in here, but we only have an hour and I'm sort of uh, going on quite a bit now. So. Uh, so I'm going to go to this co-facilitation model, which is where the research ended up arriving at. And so most programs are co-facilitated. And this is, we've got Owen here who's talking about um, what he thought. But the overall idea in the end was that if you had a really well-trained university sort of person and somebody who had more peer experience, uh, them co-facilitating. Now that's not excluding that somebody who is a peer can go through university and do those things and I do know people in that situation. But that was a context upon which these the guys I interviewed sort of saw it as you're a peer or you're a university trained person. And Owen's, um, uh, most of you online may well have started reading that but <laughs> so I won't read it. But uh, Owen's talking about how important it is to have that combination. And there was this appreciation for, the, for having good technical knowledge if, if somebody asked you a question about different aspects of, of addiction and having somebody who can say those things, but also having somebody who's, who can talk about, well, I gave it up 20 years ago or something, and, and talking from that perspective. That was where that, that sort of landed. Now I'm gonna, we're going to look at, at the Aboriginal uh, participants specifically now for a couple of slides. 
So alcohol consumption, um, lots of drinkers in their families, it was normal. And some spoke of intergenerational alcohol use, and this was whether they were or were not drinkers themselves. So the guys who identified as being drug users, they still grew up within a very dysfunctional uh, environment in lots of cases. And Bill's talking there, well, my family, my dad, he's a drinker, he's a drinker, you know, and my mum was a drinker too. My pop was a drinker, my uncles, my family, I grew up all around, all around that. You know what I mean? And yeah, that's about it. And that was, a lot of the guys had sort of similar stories to that. And you have got Neil here, like my father, he had a problem with alcohol. So did his father, yeah. So over the years, there's been a lot of, yeah, you know, alcohol, you know, domestic violence related to alcohol, but mainly just alcohol. And this actually meant that some of the guys chose not to drink and they decided to, to uh, use heroin or something else instead because they were so sort of put off from the dysfunction they'd seen uh, from alcohol use within their families. Um, so drug use, so they used to block out emotional turmoil, financial difficulties and stress of family conflict. So Ian's talking about heroin. Um, I won't lie, I loved it, you know what I mean, it's the ultimate, it's the ultimate drug, it takes away all your problems. He goes on to say, you should try some bro, it's really good. Um, so <laughs> didn't take him up on that, but um, he recommended it if I was stressed to take that. Maybe something about doing a PhD, he could see I was a bit stressed. <laughs> um, so it's, it's this, it was sort of a force field, one of the guys talked about. If you've got lots of stresses, you take this and, and it feels much better, uh, particularly heroin, actually. Uh, amphetamines it sort of is a different distraction altogether, but heroin, you just chill out, doesn't worry. You don't worry about uh, things. So several said they used AOD to function normally. Uh, so this is a sort of, this is a interesting. So if they didn't, racism wasn't explicitly uh, questioned, uh, wasn't a specific thing that I asked them. But reading through this, and when I was sitting there looking at the data, the idea that you as an Aboriginal man need to take something to be able to walk down the street in this country is a bit strange, isn't it? Uh, and it really could be an indication of that feeling of racism and stigmatisation, particularly against Aboriginal men. And I know personally what that feels like. Um, and so that's possibly another area to look at for future research within this as well. Uh, many had impoverished circumstances but did not link their AOD use to being poor. And this was something that was quite specific. Uh, we might say it's more likely if you're in that group or this or that. But when I did the analysis and asked them, they were like, well, no, I didn't drink because I was poor. I drank because, you know, things were fucked up or whatever. Um, but not necessarily, in their opinions, a direct link themselves. Uh, and the cycle of offending, and I described this a bit earlier, and that was sort of committing the, the offence and doing the crimes uh, and that sort of thing. What, what the Koori fellas tended to do more than the non-Aboriginal guys was if they'd been using ice, they would use cannabis in order to come off ice. But it's, that's probably better in the domain of quantitative research and you'd need a sort of a bigger sort of sample and to look at that. But that was just a little bit of a trend I noticed in that data. Um, so, in terms of withdrawal, nine of the 14 guys had attempted to withdraw while in the community, and this is a really important point, they tried to get off drugs and tried to do those things, but they found it difficult to access services, and you've got Ray there, that's the time I tried quitting and it didn't work. The best thing that's probably happened to me is I come to jail, now I don't need it. And there's almost a sense of relief, uh, not just for the Koori guys, but some of the other guys, that, that when the drug use came to a head and they ended up. Uh, as I sort of said, it's, nobody's happy about being in prison, but sometimes it's, it's, there are some benefits and getting off drugs is one of those, and having that kind of clinical support as well. So there's something not quite right there if they're trying to access services in the community, but ending up in prison and getting services there. Um, so supportive treatment relationship. So, um, so if you remember talking about confidentiality and group dynamics before, you've got Ed here. If you've got other people there, you'd know. If you don't know them real well, it, if you know them real well, it's good. But you've got a problem. But 
when you're when you're with queries, you feel more comfortable with them because it's like your brother. There's a big difference, uh, or there's a bit of a difference. Now, this was pretty much all of the guys said that you instantaneously trust the other query fellows. So if you have a query only group. Um, that sort of trust or um, confidentiality in those issues just kind of evaporates in a query only group. Um, it's just one of those things. Uh, and Aboriginal men said you needed a sense of humour. This was a very specific uh, finding. None of the white fellows talked about having to have a laugh. And you've got Neil here saying there's good qualities and really uh, talking about facilitators they need to really put in. And, um, and then he goes on to say, and a bit of a sense of humour as well. Uh, the ability to have a good laugh in group was seen as, as being a, a good thing for the query fellows. Program availability. Well, on remand, you got Jess here, he'd been on remand for 18 months. He couldn't do no courses because he was on remand and he got sentenced and then he started getting treatment. So he's been in prison effectively or been held in custody on remand and then sort of as a sentenced prisoner for about two years by the time he was about to start this treatment program. Uh, and repeating programs, Carl's talking there about uh, having to do programs several times. So there's limited resources in prison. So I think the tendency tends to be if you haven't done a program, we'll put you into one and try and get everybody through one each. But Carl's there saying, I had to do it three times just to really, to really get something out of it, out of the program. So yeah, I've done it four times now. And the third and fourth, like the first two times, I didn't get nothing out of it. So I've done it again and again. And so it's good to repeat programs. And people might need to do them three or four times for it to really sort of get an understanding of, of how that all works for them. Release and um, from prison and relapse. So 12 of the guys had previously been released from prison. Um, Six of them used it from the first 24 hours. Five of those six had planned to. They just said that that's exactly what they were going to do. Uh, one of them is sort of incidental. The other six uh, relapse within three months or less. Uh, and basically because of this, all, almost all of these men returned to the same social and accommodation circum and circumstances as previously. Uh, and so after about three months, if you're with all your old playmates, it's pretty hard not to use is pretty much where they were, what they were saying or not to drink. Uh, so the other thing which came up a little bit was this transfer directly to residential rehabilitation from prison and three of the guys had actually done this which is perhaps a um, an alternative to returning back to exactly the same situation. Uh, you got Ed here, um, he, he ended up at his uncle's place uh, sort of serendipitously because uh, he was at the train and somebody came along and said, oh, I know your uncle, and they took him to his uncle's house. And um, this was his auntie um, yelling at him, and he was, he was, he was, uh, she must have really had a go at him because I could tell when he's telling me what she was saying, is she said, go, go, get to rehab, you need to go. And uh, he just said, I want to stay here with my family, you know. And um, so his auntie was trying to drive him out. And he just, he wanted to spend time with his family before he went to rehab. But of course he didn't arrive at the rehab. So then his parole and all, that all got breached. And then he ended up, he ended up going on the run as a result uh, for a while. And then ended up in prison eventually. Um, so coming to the last couple of slides. So Aboriginal men working with Aboriginal men. Uh, so this is Jim, uh, and he's talking about uh, when he was on parole. He said, I can't talk in a group. I told her, and this is the parole officer he's talking to, I told her, I'll go there and sit and be mute. I can't talk in a group. So she said, how about the Aboriginal Medical Service? You can find someone to do one-to-ones. I said, yeah, probably. I found someone that I was uh, more comfortable with, and that's, that's I continued with that when I was out while I was on parole. And he'd, he'd continued seeing this, and this guy, I know this particular um, Aboriginal um, drug and alcohol worker, he's an elder. And Jim is, in, Jim is, he went, he re-offended, but he, he, he was like, 
I want to go and see see this fellow again. I'll be sort of mindful of confidentiality because I feel bad, and I, I I just I think if I see him, then that'll help. And and it was just this whole different dynamic. And this was a younger Aboriginal man who was seeing an Aboriginal elder, who was his um, drug and alcohol counsellor. And so there really is some advantage, I think, for Aboriginal men working with Aboriginal men. So one of the challenges for the future, um, I would say, is, is this as well. And this comes through quite clearly, and this is something I think we talk about. And the only dream is football. Uh, so when I talked to the fellas about what they wanted to be or what they ever dreamt of, the only thing they could ever imagine was playing football. And you've got Jim there. Now this isn't a bad thing and you know we do really well at league and, and I'm more an Aussie rules fella um, but not everybody's going to make it and I know there are training academies and things and yeah you might get into those things that's, and if you do that's really good I'm not having a go at that but reinforcing the need to, to have a plan B um, and to, to be able to get skills to do something else because even if you do make it, you might not, you know, you retire at 30, 35, that's it. Um, so I think as a community, I would say we need to think about not just football. Football's great, but something else as well. So, summary. Uh, so high incarceration rates, Aboriginal and Torres Strait, high incarceration, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, so alcohol and other drug treatment programs are needed, so clearly there's a high level, 75% uh, is uh, drugs and alcohol. Program facilitators need good empathy and confidentiality is, is critically important. Group dynamics, trust and confidentiality within group are really, really important or the whole program just kind of breaks <coughs> down as the guys were saying. And for the future, I think maybe more Aboriginal men working with Aboriginal men on their drug and alcohol issues. Uh, and I put their challenge for the future for us as a community, and I call it, well, football is great, but what about a plan B? Um, so that's it for me. I don't know if you want to leave on that slide or we can go to the next one. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Any questions from the room? Or comments? Yeah, thanks for um, coming in. Um, it was really good listening to you talk. Um, my team, a few of my team members are here. Um, we're an Indigenous mental health intervention program that works in the um, women's and men's prison here in Brisbane. Um, and we work from an holistic approach and it's very cultural. So um, this is our senior uh, coordinator, uh, clinician here in the men's team. So when we're working with them, when, we, what, when you're talking about um, programs and that, we have to look at the whole entire um, needs of the clients and then uh, work with them in prison um, around treatment, around interventions and all that sort of stuff, ready for release into community. Yeah. Um, we came out of a couple of um, research, so I've got these documents for you actually. Oh, the Inside cool. Out report and oh, yeah. um, the family business. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, so what that's for you to have a um, Thank you. Back to, um, yeah. Western Australia. Uh, really I'm in Sydney so, now, so yeah, yeah, yeah. but Sorry. originally from WA. Yeah, yeah. so um, yeah, I just wanted to let you know that and um, give you this information and um, yeah. have a yarn with you after the. Um Happy to. How did you, was that like sort of your, I mean this is New South Wales type, but yeah. what I've found is uh, it's, uh, people say very similar sort of experiences in every state. Yeah. Was that pretty consistent with, with what you've, what, and I see a few nodding heads, <laughs> uh, what, you, what you deal, yeah. And Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, um, is that, that's your Beyonce there? Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. out of these studies, um, we found that there was about, uh, um, there was about well, 73% of Aboriginal men um, had their first drink and out of that, yes, um, that cohort were um, about 38% of women with post-traumatic stress disorders, and then we're looking at um, some studies into the men, into the, um, they just begun in about 2017 in the men's prison, so we're looking at um, yeah. the research flow into that as well. But um, yeah, alcohol and um, drugs is a major um, contributor. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think that sort of being in the, when you return home, it, some of the guys said it's like putting on your old shoes. Like um, you just go back and it's the same situation. And it's really hard mm. to try and change if you go back to exactly that. And um, I'm not saying that non-Aboriginal pe- it's, people can't work with Aboriginal people. That was really very clearly the guy said that the biggest thing was empathy. They just said empathy was more important than necessarily being Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, like just being a really good empathetic person because some of our mob sometimes aren't that empathetic. But being Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander really helped like, as well. So having good empathy and being Aboriginal were, were very were the combination, if you get what I mean. Um, but for non-Aboriginal people, just being really empathetic and understanding and knowing where people are coming from was, was something that was, um, the guy said works really well for them. You mentioned during your uh, presentation about people attempting to uh, get onto community treatment and they were finding it difficult. What were the difficulties? Oh, that was trying to withdraw before. So, um, yeah, so the, those guys, um, there was nine of the 14 Aboriginal guys. I had a specific look at the, the, that. Um, basically, access to services, um, not being able to get into a detox when you, you really wanted to, uh, and it's just not being available in some parts um, of New South Wales. So the guys... and. There's a different demographic with the Aboriginal guys, about half of them are from regional New South Wales, only half were from Sydney, because that's pretty much how the population is. A lot more Aboriginal people live in regional areas. And there's some real difficulty with access to services, particularly in those areas. So it's not, I wouldn't want to quantify that because it's qualitative data. So I can just talk about their experiences and, and that's, that's what they found. So possibly they're, more research in that area to see how much of a problem that is. Um, but certainly when they went to prison they could access services there. Does that answer that question? No? Yes, it does actually. Yeah. Like, so I, was, I suppose I was thinking more reasonably rather than, than actually out, 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 out of the sticks. Uh, there is lack of facilities out there. You know, to worry about that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm Rosalind, I'm in the statewide uh, forensic mental health team. Um, my question to you is where do you go from here? Because I feel like Queensland Health, we're all driven by evidence based practice and research. So we're wondering what your next journey is going to be. Action is important. Yeah. Conversations. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Rosalind. Um, yeah, that's the. Uh, so. I, I'm looking at post-prison care and I'm sort of involved with four different types of projects. We're um, initiating a new new one that's more driven by myself and um, two other, um, Jill Roberts, uh, who's the Director of Drug and Alcohol and Justice Health, and, and my boss, uh, Kate Conagrave, looking at alcohol treatment when people come in, so a detox and that sort of thing when they first uh, sort of come into custody which will be interesting because what we're, we're wondering is how many people come in, they detox and they leave and they come back and they detox again and what happens with the alcohol side of stuff because there, there tends to be an illicit drug focus and look, it's important to look at that as well. Um, where it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's more I think that can be done with, with, within the alcohol space, particularly for post-release support. So also involved with a bit of work um, looking at an evaluation um, of, of the Connections program. So I'm sort of part of a bit of that work. But yeah, so there are two bits. Um, and yeah, so it's been about 12 months since I finished the PhD, so I still sort of working in that space and working up a few new projects. So it would be, yeah. there's a lot more work to be done in this space. <laughs> Got a couple of online questions. Um, how did you go engaging with some of the younger kind of prison populations? Was there any difficulties getting information from them? Or uh, no. Uh, so. Uh, this was uh, the interviews were done um, at a men's uh, 
call it an adult prison, but they're not really men when they're 21, 22, are they? Like, they still feel very much like kids. But um, no, not a problem. Um, so I found, well, this is the thing when you go in and you interview them, they're always very happy to talk to you, the guys themselves. It's getting through all the ethics processes to get to be able to do interviews. That's the difficult part. So, so they're really normally very forthcoming with what they say and things like that. What was interesting, I'm a bit older than some of the um, younger Koori fellas, and they were really interested in why I was working for a university. And they asked lots of questions about how do you get into university, do you think I'm smart enough, and that sort of stuff, which was kind of not expected. So I guess it was easy to engage, but it was also an interesting um, process with that. So, yeah. Uh, and do programs make accommodations for people with FASD diagnosed or not? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, I would say no. I mean, there's different programs in every state, but, but FASD within the adult prison population is something that's not really been looked at. So we know from research from, um, from Western Australia, uh, which was conducted by the Telephone Institute at Banks Year Hill, um, I think it was something like, I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to quote, but it was really high. It was like 75% of the, the young people in there, I think, might have had some form along the spectrum, because you can be anywhere along that spectrum from mildly to... Now, when I interviewed some of the guys, uh, I did wonder about that, because they say, because a lot of people who ha are slightly affected, they, they sort of, uh, you know, present as being pretty fine, yeah. but um, yeah, uh, th there's, there is a very slight cognitive uh, sort of issue for some fellas that might not get picked up. But yeah, a huge proportion I'd say in the prison possibly, yeah. more research needed in that area. Uh, yeah. And was there any kind of discussions around maybe childhood abuse or trauma as part of the yeah. Discussions on how that might have affected them. Um, yeah, so, um, okay. So the, out, out of the two groups, from the, the Aboriginal guys and non-Aboriginal guys, the Aboriginal guys were far more talkative when it came to talking about their family and growing up and stuff, and I think that's a cultural thing, but I also wondered whether it's being, it's just two Aboriginal fellows, you have any yarn, so you talk about your family a bit more. Um, so, so, I can't, there was certainly issues that seemed to be raised um, within that context, uh, not just seemed, one of the guys did say that, that um, he was put with his uncle and his uncle used to bash him, uh, stuff like that, so some really heavy end abuse and also this thing that they were perhaps removed uh, put by uh, um, the government, by, what is it called, Family and Children's Services. But then there was no real follow-up as well, as the other thing some of them talked about was that we got put with this person and then nobody came and asked us if we were OK, and they weren't OK, uh, and kids growing up with grandparents as well. So, so there's only 14 of them, but that was the general trends. Non-Aboriginal guys didn't talk about it as much, but I would certainly suspect so if there had been a different kind of conversation and it wasn't really focused on that early childhood stuff but some of them also had pretty stuffed up childhoods and one of them had a really serious case of um, mental health problems with his parents uh, and I really felt for that guy, his parents were really not well mentally and it, yeah. Mm. A couple of really good questions. Are you aware of uh, Medicare being re removed from those in prisons so they cannot access Aboriginal health services programs? This has come from a, a worker in a high security prison. Yeah. I don't think if Medi I, I think it's probably absolutely they can't get Medicare. Um, so um, I think it's more that they would never, uh, under the Medicare Act, there's a clause that if they're provided services by, the, uh, by um, state um, or jurisdictional governments, uh, then they don't, they're ineligible for Medicare. I can't remember the exact wording, but there's this clause, uh, it's one line in the Medicare Act that means that they, you can't claim Medicare while you're in the custody uh, in prisons. Um, it's something that uh, has been work to redress uh, and it would be great if they could. Uh, and it's something, yeah, it's, uh, 
Yeah. yeah. I guess the other issue with that is whether your health service is run by the health department or whether it's run by corrective services. And there is this push that it should be run by the health department rather than the corrective services. I'm not 100% sure what's happening in Queensland in that regard. Yeah. Queensland Health now? Yes. Yeah. Because that transition wasn't that long ago, was it? Uh, about seven or eight years ago or something? Like, yeah, so WA it's still corrective services runs the health health services and there's this real push because the health department, you access all of the resources from within the health department when it's an arm of the health department and so there's a strong argument that health services should be run yeah. by a health, health department. I don't know if that answers that fellow or that lady's question, but that's... In the interest of time, I think it does. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and just lastly, um, and I don't know if you covered this, but many of your interviewees have contact with statutory bodies like child protection and youth justice, criminal justice, I can assume they all yeah, uh, they all do. So in terms of um, when they were younger, a lot of them did have um, contact with with um, fa with uh, family and community services. Um, they were very reluctant to talk about um, too much about their background. So the question is, uh, you know, uh, uh, how what were you, do you have children, like just starting the questions and it became quite um, immediate when I did the first interview that they didn't want to say that they had children because they were worried about, and I figured it pretty quickly, that they were concerned about family and children's services. So, so, so in the greater context of their family life, some of them, yeah, absolutely, there were issues, involvement with multiple government departments, statutory departments, yeah. And lastly, since you're originally from WA, any plans to go back there and do projects? No, n no. Uh, uh, yes, in terms of, yeah, I'd love to do some work in WA, but I do love living in Sydney now, although I miss uh, every time I go home, particularly when I go up to Kimberley when it's cold in <laughs> June. In <the> yeah, <laughs> if I'm up there, uh, it's, yeah, but. Um, yeah, I would, most of my work's been in New South Wales, so I guess that's the other thing. I'd love to do more work else in yeah. other parts of the country. But thanks for the question. Well, thank you very much for sharing some of your time up here in Queensland and nationally through the webinar program. Join me, thank Dr Michael Doyle.